everyone. Welcome to Music Scene Investigation. Rich Wildman here, and we're glad you've joined us today. It's going to be a very interesting day, if it's nothing else. It's a uh, rainy day here in the States, and uh, we're hoping that that rain doesn't cast any power outages our way, and we'll we'll have to wait and see how things go to... Uh, you know, figure out what's going on, I guess. It's kind of like we have to pass the bill before we can read what's in the bill. You all know how that turned out, right? Well, it's the same way here on today's MSI. We've got three new songs we're going to be bringing to you during the show today. Should be a pretty good time. I've listened to the songs. Our panel will listen to the songs for the first time a little bit later in the broadcast without having the advantage of knowing who the song is by, the name of the song, or the genre of the song. It's going to be a good time. We'll figure out, or find out rather, what they have to say about the music once they've heard it. Now let's go around and meet our in-house panelists all the way from Mr. New York City. I said Mr. New York City because no one ever says it's Mrs., do they, Tommy? Tom Chianti. Not that I not live. Exactly. That's kind of what I thought. They just, uh, it's Mr. New York. So how are you? I'm doing fine, sir. Um, the back is, is gone through some awful, awful torment. As you can see, we, we installed a new board, an all analog board. And, um, we're going to go all analog as much as we can for a while. And then, do the hybrid thing and and then you get crazy. It looks like a very nice board. It's very big. It's got a bigger footprint than your other one from the looks of it. Yeah. Well, the other one, you know, uh, the, the was very easy. Instead of having all this out here in front of you, you just had to flip pages on the screen, which some people like. I mean... If I want to flip pages, I'll go to the library and read books. <laughs> I want to look. I want to look at my board, see where the EQ is, see what faders are up all at once, and this does it very nicely. Well, good. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. Looks very nice. It's a nice dark color, matches your studio. Yeah, this is true, and my mood. Exactly. There you have it. All right. Your heart. Glad to see you, Tom, and uh, that voice you just heard is none other than Mr. Ian Husbands in London, England. Ian, how are you, sir? I'm here. Well, I'm glad you're here. Everything going all right, I hope. Yeah, everything's good. Busy, busy. Um, managed to get back onto some of our stuff, so we've uh, forged ahead on our folk album this week, which is nice, and I it's been a busy gig. Busy with the gigs and stuff like that as well. I didn't even know we were putting out a folk album. I mean, if I'd have known, I would have wore a straw hat and maybe some overalls. You did know, Rich, because you were meant to be playing keyboards, and it, but you, 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 you didn't, did you? No, no. It's it's all about time management, and <laughs> I have no time to manage. <laughs> but because of that, I've got a new toy. I've got my cajon. A cajon. Now, I you told me about this... Uh, this is a big box made of wood, right? Yeah, I, I asked Mr. Dave Carrera of Carrera Drums and MSI fame um, to make me uh, a cajon, and he said it wasn't a cost-effective, so no, he wouldn't. So I looked on the internet, couldn't find one for less than a sort of £100, and I thought, well, I haven't got that money. A week later, Dave Carrera made me one. Well, that's pretty and now nice he, and, and now he's sold loads of them. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> that's all, now, that's did, awesome. did he give you the opportunity to uh, make it a signature series, an Ian Husband signature series, Cajon? I did offer him that potential, but apparently something about not being a very good percussionist is a bit of a letback on, on that sort of signature series. I wouldn't know why. I, you know. I mean, after all, it's a name on a product, and everybody knows if there's a name on the product, that product will sell like hotcakes. Yeah, but they, they tend to value that product being endorsed by someone who's quite good at it. And you know, I've got a lot of learning to do, let's just say that. Well, you, you're a quick learner. <laughs> yeah, it, all, yeah, it, yeah. it all works. It all works. There you go. Sounds, sounds like a table. It, it's a box. 
<laughs> All right, I'll take your word for it, Ian. And our guest panelist today is joining us from across the pond as well. You know him, you love him, you read him. Uh, actually, you read his website, not he himself. That would be kind of interesting, though. Mr. Rob Piricelli from failedmuso.com. Rob, how you doing? Um, very well, thank you. How are you? Doing real well. Now, i got to let everybody know we've got you via voice only, which is why I have the uh, the static picture of you up right now. So uh, everything seems uh-huh. to be uh, sounding really good. So how have you been? How have uh, things been going? Um, yeah, been going very, very well. Um, I've moved house, which means I've also moved studio uh, because the studio goes in the house. Um, and I have a big room now, <clears throat> which you can't see, which is a real disappointment, which actually is not too bad because it is a bit of a mess still. Um, when I normally have a, a fair light behind me, I've actually just got a pile of crap, basically, um, <laughs> until I get the fair light out of its flight cases. Um, that's the last thing that's going to go in because that's the big heavy thing. But no, other than that, I've been good. I've been busy um, with a day job, and I've started doing radio again. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a weekly radio show, uh, just playing music that I really like again, and that's that's been quite fun. Now I've seen I've seen your notices on that uh, out on Twitter, and uh, it looks like you're having a great time doing that. What made you decide to uh, get back into doing that? Um, I gave up a couple of years ago because I, I got a new job and um, that was with an American company that necessitated me flying around the world doing different things. And I couldn't commit to doing a weekly regular show. So I, I did the honorable thing and said, look, go and get somebody else who can. And so I gave it up. And I've been doing radio on and off now for many years. And I was really disappointed that I had to do it. But, you know, the job pays the bills and that comes first. And a whole bunch of people that listened to my show were quite disappointed that I'd stopped, which was nice. And they went and started their own online radio station, kind of in my honor, which was uh, quite humbling and a little bit embarrassing. But to, to, to their credit, they've done a fantastic job and started to get quite a following online, which is really good. They called the station um, Radio Pure Gently because they, one of the guys had trouble pronouncing my surname. And so he, he used to come up with different versions, and that was a, a version that stuck for some reason. But it seems to have done the trick, and they uh, they now have something like half a dozen shows a week, and there's more coming on board. And I, a little while ago, the job that I'm doing kind of calmed down a bit, and I wasn't doing so much traveling. And I said, look, guys, I can... I can maybe do a show. And they said, please do. So I now do a, a live show on a Friday evening at 9 p.m. UK time. And uh, for two uh, two hours, I just play music I really like. Uh, and a lot of it is, and, and the whole thing with this station is that it plays a lot of unsigned artists. And um, we, I have mentioned you guys, and I think maybe we should, we should get together so, at some point and talk and sharing uh, some of the material. Well, sure, absolutely. I know that uh, as, you know, with you and, and a lot of our uh, guest panelists we have on, you know, the uh, one of the things we do is promote indie music. That's one of our goals, especially here on MSI. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'd be happy to share that, share the music that uh, the artists themselves, you know, uh, want to get heard. Yeah, and, and we've actually had, I say we, the station, actually played someone – uh some weeks ago um and they've now got a deal because somebody heard them on our station so they've got a contract uh, i'm not sure whether it's a uh you know a publishing contract or something else but uh, they they're starting to get paid to do what they love doing and and that was really gratifying to to hear that so uh yeah it works um you know we get a good listenership so it's uh, it's worth doing and and there's a bunch of people that are really passionate about doing it which passion you know for me is the number one thing that you should have on on your curriculum vitae and there's a lot of people with that so that's good absolutely i i I can't agree more with you uh you know you stated it perfectly if you're not passionate about it you should probably find something else you should you know that you are passionate about really and uh, that makes perfect sense well good luck on that uh 
How's everything else been going? I know uh, NAB here in the States is uh, going on this weekend. In fact, I uh, it's over this weekend. Have you had uh, any dealings or have have has your work required that you have any dealings with that aspect of what's been happening? <laughs> no, not really. I, I have to admit that um, the whole failed muso thing has kind of taken a bit of a back seat of late because of the house move and various other, you know, kind of domestic things. It's um, no, I've, I've not really had much. The only thing that's been going on musically, I think, I guess since we last spoke was that as you as you're aware i um i'm restoring a, a fairlight series three right and that's that's moving slowly but i got a phone call uh actually that uh, the story goes that i i i met pete de vogel uh, the inventor of the fairlight we had lunch we've been friends for some while but we've never actually physically met so we, we had lunch uh a month or so ago and had a really very interesting conversation um about what his future plans are and how i can help out so i i can't say what those plans are at the moment but um and, and suffice not, to not say even, my mind was blown not even a hint not even not a even a smidgen hint, I'm afraid. a smidgen of a smell of a, a little bit of you know for example what did you have for lunch <laughs> ah well we had korean um which was in, incredibly nice yeah, okay. Uh, and, I, I know this nice little Korean restaurant in London, and I took him there. But I, all right. So the the one thing I can tell you is that if you are a lover of Fairlights, if you have always yearned to own a Fairlight CMI, then your opportunity to do that in some form, which is not um, an iOS application. So this this is uh, you know just. Oh, I have to, I'm really having to think about my words here. Um, let's just say that, yeah, uh, outside of a, a, an app, you know, an app world, this is this is something other than an app. Uh, if 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 that's the kind of thing you're uh, looking to do, then that could be very achievable, very soon, and very very affordable. No. That's all I'm going to say before I incriminate myself. All right, well, fair enough, fair enough. At least we got something out of you. See. Even even yeah. even the strictest, and, and then from that, <laughs> okay, go from ahead. that, I'm actually going to be getting a series two. Oh, really? So I'm getting a second Fairlight. Yeah, which is, and that's the one I really wanted because that's the classic. You know, that's that's the um, you know the the you know the, the classic Fairlight, and um, I'm picking that up. I've got I've got to drive down to the other side of the country to pick that up from what seems to be um the kind of musical center of the universe uh, which is a town called bath um down in the west country of england where peter gabriel records and chris hughes records and uh, golf rap record and and it's tears of fears from from there everyone seems to come from bath so i'm going down there to pick this up and um that's going to be another restoration job and that's i think that's the one that i'm going to try and keep oh yeah i don't blame you i mean if it's if it's your dream machine may as well go for it yeah well, that's indeed, awesome. indeed. That's the one. Excellent. Well, I, I certainly so wish you I'm the best of luck on that. Yeah. Now, uh, the the idea of, of ever now not everybody may know what a fair light is. I mean, of course, uh, we get viewers, new viewers uh, who come in and join us every week, uh, who who listen to the recorded broadcast and whatnot. So. Uh, for those who don't know what a fair light is, maybe you could tell them a little bit about it and a little bit about where they've probably heard a fair light and not even remembered or have known that they had heard one of these things. Sure. Um, the simplest way, I guess, to describe a fair light CMI, and the CMI stood for Computer Musical Instrument, and that pretty much sums up what it is. Um, the, the simplest way of defining it is it is... Uh, year zero when it comes to computers and music making in a single box you know we take that for granted nowadays um you know i i'm a propeller head reason person when it comes to music making i have this one application i load into my computer i have a controller keyboard and i can pretty much do anything i want i can sequence i can throw audio in i can mix it i can do all sorts of stuff the Fairlight was kind of ground zero. That was um, where it all started. It was a combination of what was at the time cutting edge 
computer processing technology and software with premium hardware. So we're talking a machine that has a separate sound card, and that's probably the best way of describing it, although it's something a bit more than that, but a separate sound card for each voice. And each of those sound cards had its own processing, you know, CPU. So Im imagine having a, a, a computer with um, 16 sound cards, and each of those sound cards is running an Intel i7 processor. That's kind of the equivalent of what it was back then. And it needed that to do what it was doing, which was essentially synthesizing sound electronically like most synthesizers do, although it did it in rather than being subtractive synthesis, which is the most common form, it was uh, more additive synthesis. Um, but the big thing that it was famous for was sampling. It was the first professional commercial digital sampler. So in their quest for perfect sound, they found that they couldn't recreate it that well in synthesis. And they... Basically, Peter Vogel says, well, what if we record this sound digitally and use that? And they did. And to get around the technological limitations of the hardware at the time that was cutting edge, they did a lot of um, jiggery pokery, used a lot of hardware and software uh, technology to get over a lot of the sonic obstacles. So it really was, you know, the, it was the Rolls Royce of music making devices. And all of a sudden, one person could compose and score and produce an entire piece of music with multiple instruments and instrumentation okay. and audio and synthesis. And this has in, been in, heard yeah. by countless people, even though they don't know they've heard it in uh, some of their favorite music uh, over the mm. past 30 or 40 years. Absolutely. And, and it's still being used today. I mean, Coldplay used it on an album a couple of albums ago. They used a Fairlight. Um, it's it's still highly sought after. And, you know, if, if basically anything from the early 80s through to the mid early mid 90s, uh, almost certainly had something of a Fairlight uh, going on in there. So, you know, you could say to give you some examples, you know, big proponents of the Fairlight were bands like Art of Noise. Uh, anything that had anything to do with Trevor Horn probably had a fair light on it somewhere in the early 80s, although mm -hmm. he moved on to the Synclavier afterwards. But um, yeah, I mean, it was I mean, I've got the fair light I've got here. I've got sound discs from projects that were that involved people like Brian Adams. So you wouldn't think Brian Adams would be using something like that. Right. But he was. So, yeah, it was used all over. And it was just. You know, there, there are so many songs, defining songs, and even now I'm still discovering pieces of music that use the Fairlight that I thought, wow, I, I never knew it was on that, but it was, you know, somewhere. That's one of the amazing things about it is, uh, you know, you, you just don't know. Music uh, and instruments tend to crop up virtually everywhere, and, uh, you know, uh, what... Is, is an old saying always goes over here, what goes around comes around. You know, these things are still popular, like you said. Yeah, and, and my friend uh, who lives, again, in, in the West Country of England has literally just sold, um, the, the, the sale finished just before we came on air, um, a, a Series 2 uh, Fairlight, the Series 2X, which is the, you know, the kind of the classic. Uh, he just sold that for £5,000. So that's, that's got to be around seven and a half, eight thousand dollars. Right. right. Uh, people, people still pay this money uh, for this machine, even though it is incredibly difficult to use compared to what we have nowadays. Um, you really do have to unlearn everything uh, to, to to learn how to use the Fairlight. Um, you know, you used light pen on on a touch screen, which was in you know back then was unheard of. Right. But, yeah, that's what it was. And of course, it cost the same as about two uh, two houses in the UK at the time. So, you know, these machines were selling for $100,000 upwards. Right. These are like these are like classic cars. Is oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. These are yeah. the, the, the most classic of classic cars. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's see if uh, we might be able to find some classic cars in some of the music we're going to hear today uh so if you don't mind gentlemen i've got three songs that are ready for you guys to listen to so if we can do that uh we'll find out uh what you think about them so let's take a listen right now to song number one on today's music scene investigation everybody this is it this is song number one hope you enjoy it <laughs>
That is song number one on today's MSI. Now we're going to go over to the guys and find out what they thought. We're going to start things out with Ian. Ian, track number one. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, we're opening the show with a good old slice of cock rock, um, harking back to the days <laughs> of Motley Cruz and people like that. It's true, isn't it? It's proper full-on cock rock. <laughs> Uh, hey, I've got I've got a place in my heart for uh, that sort of style of music, and uh, you know I listen to the Motley Crues and the Poisons, and it's got that so that bluesy sort of dirty vibe to it, which I like. There's some good performances going on there as well. I did like the drums, uh, but overall I felt the mix it seemed really unbalanced. It didn't seem to be coming out much the left hand side. Um, unless I'm going deaf in my left ear, except for that tambourine, which was a uh, Slightly too high in the mix and a tad annoying. But, um, you know, the mix was unbalanced. And and even though I get the idea that this is a raw, live, good time feel, sort of punky, rocky, you know, take, I would have liked to have heard the production a bit more slicker, refine those guitars a bit, tighten those drums up a bit, um, you know, less of the live sound on the drums. They get that bass cutting through a little bit more, make the you know give a bit more clarity and says that bottom end rumble, and you know balance those vocals out a little bit more. I like what's going on. The the vocals were a bit pitchy uh, in times, but in, in many ways it kind of added to that live charm of the track. Um, but yeah, I think you know go back and remix this and and you know use some compression on those guitars and and tighten the bass up a little bit and. Get those drums popping through a little bit nicer, and uh, I think you've got a great track. All right, fair enough. I appreciate that, Ian. Thank you. And over to Mr. Tom Chianti and his thoughts. Tom, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I can agree with a lot of what Ian said. Um, the, um, as a, as a, a song, um, I think this style of the music speaks louder than the lyrics of the song if that makes any sense to you um it's it's definitely got that sound that ian was talking about about the mix i don't know whether it's too um Hashy, edgy in the upper mids, uh, a little too sharp for my ears. Um, the guy's got a great voice, and like Ian says, there are you know great uh, parts going on there, and 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 it could be you know made better with a, a, a better mix. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I think the background vocals. Could have been just a little bit tighter, and, and actually, with this, I would have expected, you know, a bunch of guys at the edge of the bar clanging their beer glasses, all you know, coming in on the choruses there, instead of just one or two voices. You know, give it a, a nice chant, a heavy male voice, uh, just ripping through the choruses. Um. The guitar playing, it was the sound I didn't like. The playing is good. And the bass, like Ian said, is just a low-end drone. I mean, I know he's just playing 16th notes or 8th notes um, and just basically following the root of the guitars. But um, do something maybe with the EQ or, or just play a different bass riff. Um, to make it more interesting and don't let the guitars carry the riff. You know, pay the counter melody or a counter riff that adds more rhythm and drive to the track. But it is a good track. Um, and um, I think they, you know, it's one hell of a demo, that's for sure. But it needs some work. All right, Tom, I appreciate that as well. Over to Mr. Rob Piricelli. Rob, uh, your take on track number one? 
Uh, I liked it. It was, um, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, it was kind of formulaic, but there's nothing wrong with following a good formula. And, and, and that kind of followed the, as Ian put it, you know, that kind of cock rocking formula. Uh, there's a name for an album. Um, <laughs> I, I like the, the clarity. <laughs> I like the clarity of the mix. Um, but I soon noticed why it was so clear. And this kind of comes into what the other guys were saying. The only kind of low frequencies I was hearing was the kick drum. I really couldn't hear the bass. Uh, the, you know, and I'm assuming it's a bass guitar. Um, it was I, you could. It was there. You knew it was there because it was certainly filling in those those frequencies. But it wasn't punching through. And I think uh, it might have been Ian that said that it, you know the, the mix sounded a little bit too thin and sort of high pit or you know sort of high frequency stuff. And I think that's probably because there wasn't enough low end to to balance it out. So. You know, that was the first big observation was that the the bass wasn't as punchy as it could have been. And I agree with Tom in that it could have been a bit more interesting. You know, some of these, it, if, if you're going to do a, a formulaic kind of piece or you know, type of music, then at least do it in a very interesting way. And the bass line is one of the best ways to kind of uh, spice that kind of thing up because, you know, you can have those chunky driving guitars but if you've got a clever bass line going on there, that can really make one hell of a difference. Um, you know, I would say put that bass better in the mix and and have that bass player, um, you know, just give him a few beers or something, loosen him up and <laughs> let him let him go for it a little bit. Um, the backing vocals concern me because to me they sounded just a fraction out of tune. And again, I agree with Tom that they could have been more full on. Um, they just seemed to be a little bit too low, almost like they were an afterthought uh, or the people that were doing them just didn't seem to be too bothered. Um, overall, the vocal, the lead singer clearly, you know, singing in tune, which is great. It's always good to hear that. Um, but could have just been, you know, a bit more, you know, in, uh, in the mix, you know, just a bit more noticeable, a bit more powerful. You know, it seemed to kind of get lost a bit, but you know, good song. If 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 that genre is is what you know gets you going on a Saturday night before you go out and have a fight or whatever, you know, it's uh, it's great stuff. <laughs> um, the, the say it was the bass for me was the big thing that was was missing uh, in terms of the mix and of the performance. But otherwise, yeah, good song, good song. All right, I appreciate that, Rob. Thank you, and uh, let me take and introduce that track to everybody. The name of this particular track is called Steppin' Dynamite. It's by a group called Electric Shovel, and we appreciate Electric Shovel sending that track in to Music Scene Investigation. You want your track in front of our panel? All you have to do is go to musicsceneinvestigation.com, click on the Submit a Song button at the top of the page. Make sure you read the rules, though. It's got to be shorter than five minutes, radio-friendly. Those are the most important things, although there are a couple of other, others there that you need to read. And uh, just submit your music. It's very simple to do. Each week, we'll randomly select three to go in front of the panel. And uh, speaking of going in front of the panel, we have song number two up right now. So here we go, guys. Song number two on today's Music Scene Investigation happens now. Enjoy it, everyone.
Song number two on today's music scene investigation. All right, we're going to start this round out with Tom. So, Tom, what do you think of track number two? What a nice change of pace. I really, really like this. Um, there's there's uh, so many good things happening and only a few things that uh, come to my mind. There was um, some guitar parts playing little licks in the background that you could just barely hear. That should have been brought up more. I really love her voice. Um, It reminds me of like a Bonnie Raitt type of uh, um, ballad. I don't. I would say raise it a couple of BPMs, but it's a waltz, so... I don't think that matters one way or the other. Um, the only thing is the background. I, I would have liked to see them fleshed out a little bit more, especially at the end. If you're going to go out with background, they've got to be full to carry to the end. And uh, they, they were a little weak on the performance at the end and a little uncertain. So basically, um, everything is there. I mean, the mix is good. Don't get me wrong. I got no problems with the mix. You could hear everything. And her voice is beautiful and and comes out. And then the drums are nice and sitting there subtly. Um, maybe a little bit more kick it could have been heard. Um, I think if they just went in and overdubbed some extra backgrounds, to fill it out a little bit more. I love the way they threw her vocal little ads in and out here and there, made it very interesting. Nothing popped out and jarred you or anything. It was a very smooth, relaxing song. And and I'm a little old-fashioned. 
I like the verse, pre-chorus, chorus. It's a nice setup, and uh, the pre was good, and the chorus had, it was a nice hook, and the middle eight was, you know, a nice little break. So I think this is well done, just, um, and I really like it. I just think it could be made a little bit better, fleshing out, making those backgrounds stronger, and um, tightening up the mix a bit so that you can hear all the parts that are going on. And you got a, a winner. All right, Tommy, I appreciate that. Ian, who ever, who would ever thought Tommy was old-fashioned, right? Oh, yeah. a clue. with I an mean, analog desk and loads of analog synths exactly, and stuff. Exactly, exactly. That's what I thought. Rob Fericelli <laughs> from failedmuso.com. Rob, what do you think of track number two? I I really like that. This is one of the reasons I come on and do this show because I'm, I'm just waiting for somebody to uh, just grab me by the short and curlies, as we say here <laughs> in England, and um, just grab my attention. I was... I, I always have a, a, a little notepad here that I just kind of jot down things that I'm thinking so that, you know, when it comes to this part, I'm not um, lost for things to say, which is a rare thing. But I um, I loved the mix. I thought that the mix was very dynamic, and I'm, I'm really into my dynamic mixes at the moment because um, I just like to hear variation in volume and, and not, not just, you know, not volume controlled by a fader, volume in a performance, you know, the, the way that a player plays... And the way that it's produced so that, you know, I, there was dynamics in there. And I really like that. Um, the harmonies, the vocal harmonies were lovely. Um, the 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 use of instrumentation in there as well was was nice because there were things that only appeared in certain parts of the song just to embellish. So there was a little bell sound that I really liked that came in uh, in that kind of pre-chorus bit and you know, the guitars, you know, it was nice. It was interesting. And that's what I really like. I like interesting uh, music. So, that, oh, what's that? And that's new and that's different. Oh, I haven't heard that before. And rather than just, you know, oh, I love that sound. So I'm going to put it all the way through this song. That You know, that that's a great control to learn uh, is to just use when you find that great sound, just use it sparingly throughout. And, and it really makes it very interesting. So I really like that. Um Tom mentioned Bonnie Raitt. The first person that came into my head was Sarah McLaughlin. I, it was that kind of thing. It was nice. It was uh, just really pleasurable to listen to. Um, I thought the lead vocal, um, again, great voice. Re, you know, re, I could listen to that uh, all day long. I just felt it was a little dry. Um, it just sounded very dry and just could have done with just a smidge of, of a reverb just to give it a bit of body. Yeah, not too much. Um, obviously, there's nothing to disguise there. You know, it's perfectly in tune. Um, uh, overall, just, yeah, loved that song. Really, really, a very, very great effort. All right. Well, I appreciate that, Rob. Thank you. Now over to Ian, who I know is not old-fashioned. Uh, Ian, what oh, do you think? I, I hope not. Anyway, he's just um, old. <laughs> steady on. I've been finding grey hair and everything recently. It's not good. Um Right, back to the song. Please. I liked it. I liked it. Um, the mix is great. Production is great. Yeah, I liked the use of the, the xylophone and that in there and the sort of gentle groove it's, it had. Everything was sounding in place. Did like a voice. Um, I didn't like. Didn't mind the dryness of the voice, actually. I, I kind of tend towards dry vocals in the songs. But I did find that, that the first verse, before she sort of broke into that pre-chorus, she sounded very tentative. Now, whether she was trying to sort of go for that mood with the whole girl meets boy, boy moves away, thinks that boy's being faithful type feel that she was going for the track, uh, I don't know. But she sounded a bit tentative. And I found that as the, the song went on, her vocal improved vastly. Again, agree with Tom. It could have done with um, coming up in the mix a little bit. I was sat here. I was swaying away with my lighter. It is that sort of like, you know, you're sat at a festival watching the band and they're playing that sort of big sort of ballady type sort of sing along sway along song and everyone's got their lighters in the air it's got a nice vibe to it i did find it was a touch cliche uh, especially lyrically um but you know when you're writing this sort of tracks it, it it's got harder and harder not to be if that makes sense because you know there's only so much so many words in the english language we can use and everyone seems to have used them all now um and it had a, did you know there's an f in fade out yeah. 
There is. <laughs> uh, just, you know, I like, again, I think this song could have finished finished nicely. <laughs> it didn't need to just go on into the distance. Um, I, I have a thing about fade outs. That's a personal issue that I'm trying to deal with and I've actually had counselling for. Yeah, fade outs are us <laughs> is where you can find Ian every Friday afternoon at three, I think. I, I don't know. All right, Ian, I appreciate that as well. The name of this particular song is, uh, as I bring it up on the screen, it's called Crazy Love. It's by SKBs, and we appreciate their sending that track in as well. Crazy Love by SKBs on Music Scene Investigation. One more song to go, guys, and we're going to get to it right now. So here it is, everybody, song number three. On today's music scene investigation, certainly hope you enjoy it. Here you go. Now that we are grown, we are not. 
That is song number four or three on today's <laughs> music scene investigation. I'm sorry, what? it happens every once in a while. You get, I heard another song that you, never mind. Anyway, that's song number three. We're going to start it out with Mr. Rob Piricelli from Failed Muso. Rob, uh, track number three to you. What do you think? Um, where do I start? Uh, the first thing is from beginning to end, a massive grin on my face. I I just loved the song, the tune as as a tune itself. It was really great. I, I loved it. I just can't. I've I I said in my last. Uh, for song two, I said, you know, I write notes down. The only thing that I've written down, because I was so wrapped up in that song, was I love the way they've done that ending, the whole key changing, the same words, the same pattern, but just key change the whole lot in different places. Brilliant. Um, I It's probably the best track I have ever heard in the however many shows it is I've done with you guys. Um, I thought the mix was superb. The production was... If if these guys are unsigned, that is a crime um, because that sounds like the one of the most professionally produced pieces of music you could probably get. The tune was great. I love the fact that it was interesting musically. It was interesting lyrically. You weren't... You know, it was just... I loved it. I, I can't... There's not much else I can say. Other, I loved everything about it and couldn't really find anything wrong with that at all and i think probably the the only compliment the biggest compliment i can pay is that i'm waiting for you to tell me who that is because when the show is over i'm googling them and if they've got stuff to buy i my my card is here i'm, I'm going to buy some stuff it was great i loved it all right didn't, well... li- didn't like it then <laughs> <laughs> tell us what you really think <laughs> i just did it was great it's... He just said he's going to put his money where his mouth is. So, you I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that's as, as good as endorsement as you can get, really. That's true yeah. enough. Well, how about you, Ian? Is your money uh, going where your mouth is? I don't know if my money's going there, but I certainly uh, did. I agree with Rob on a, on a lot of this. What an interesting track. Really nice to sort of step away from the usual stuff we get through the door, which, you know, has stuff you can go, that sounds like this band and that sounds like that band. And, I'm sitting there thinking, eh, it's got elements of Bjork in it, maybe, but that's about as far as I can go. Like the change of pace into that chorus. Um, just, yeah, like the ly- lyrically, I can see a lot of people sort of uh, finding that. I'm guessing these aren't English or American. I'm going to guess these are sort of European. Um, she had a slight accent there, which I, I, I don't know, just added to the feel for me, uh, which was really nice. As someone said in the, uh, the chat room, it's got a lounge feel to it, and I agree with that. It's also got a sort of contemporary sort of Art Nouveau type pop movement about it as well. And I think, you know, in the right hands, as Rob said, you know, these guys should be signed and someone should be sort of touting this around a bit. All right, Ian, I appreciate it. Thank you. And Mr. Tom Chianti, all over to you now, sir. What do you think? I'll take Ian's last bunch of words. In the right hands, this would be a hit. It has, I love the girl's vocals, very interesting, the change of pace. You know, I agree a lot of what the boy, the guys think of. One thing, that end should have, that should have come in much earlier. That was, that was fully produced. And uh, that caught me more than anything. And, um... Most people won't wait to the end of a song to get caught by it. So I think as an, from an A&R point of view, the intro slow part, the use of the hesitancy in between parts and stuff, they've really got something unique going here. It just in the right hands. It's got to be produced better. And I hate to rain on everybody's parade, this thing is so close to being perfect, it almost ticked me off. Um, because I can hear so many things that, just little things, a, a lot of little things. Like I said, um, bringing that, that great built up um, vocals earlier in, not repeating every 16, 32 bars, the 
the hesitancy and a little drum and take a breath and go. There was too much of that. A little bit less of take a breath and go. We'll, we'll make the song flow more. I, I, I mean, the counter uh, vibe between the slower parts and the, you know, when that chorus first came in, it grabbed me. I said, why isn't there, why is that slow part so slow? It should, it should be tighter and flow better between the two. And it is, like I said, it's very, very unique. I think it needs to be tweaked. Um, as far as the mix goes, the guitars were too loud. I kept losing her lead. Um, uh, oh, God. And it's such a great song and such a great idea. But for me, it just missed the mark by using overusing the unique parts a little bit too much going against what Rob said about the earlier song, not killing it with that, that's a great sound, I'm going to use it throughout. That over effect the guitar is great, but it was too far up in the mix. And all I can remember is trying to hear this beautiful voice singing and the harmonies fight with that. And when it, at the tail end, when the fully produced a uh, chorus comes in with the interesting, you know, same words, just changed it up a little bit. I think that should have been for the second half of the song. And that first part where the guitar is played, cut that in half. You know, make it a little shorter. Get it to flow smoothly, top, middle, and bottom. And don't overuse the the drum roll break and breathe and go. And, you know, like I said, it's very, very unique. They're into a sound here. And um, I'm definitely going to Google them just to see what the rest of this stuff sounds like. And um, it's, like I said, I, I like it. I loved the whole concept. It just fell a little short of the greatness that I hear that it could be. All right, Tommy. Fair enough. I appreciate that. Let's find out who this is. This track is called, as we bring it up on the screen, Once Upon a Time. It's by a group called Vipership. And we appreciate Vipership sending that track in to Music Scene Investigation. So that's who you're going to Google, guys. It's Vipership. So now you know. Now you know. Now, of course, we have the task ahead of you of deciding on a uh, song of the week. So I'm going to let you guys do that right now as I invite everybody to cast their vote and fill out their witness statement. Go to musicsceneinvestigation.com slash witness to make that happen as these guys talk about their choice for song of the week. Gentlemen? Firstly, I'd like to say it's been a really great week for music. You know, some weeks are good, some weeks are indifferent, some weeks are damn right bad. Um, and this week has been one where all the songs have been of, of quite high standards in their own sort of rights. So uh, it's, you know, I'm not going to say it's not an easy decision for me because it is, and I'm going to go with song number three. Um, but all the tracks are, good, are stand-up examples tonight of what we should be listening to. All right, fair enough. All right, uh, Rob, Tom? Go ahead, Rob. I, oh. I think I know what you're going to go with. <laughs> yeah, it, it's probably, I. yeah, I, I gave that away. Didn't, I should have um, held back a little bit and built the suspense. But no, uh, it's a no-brainer for me. And, and as, as Ian has said, you know, it's not like the other two songs were bad because they were far, far from bad. You know, they, they were different, and I really like the variety. We've gone from kind of cock rock to country ballad to I don't know what song three is. And I, that's probably the thing I love about it is that it doesn't fit into a genre because I hate genres and I hate labels. And, and that song has just intrigued me. And I want to hear more because I, I'm hoping that I'm going to like everything else that I hear. Um, and yeah, song number three, Viper Ship. Um, if, if you've got stuff for sale, you're getting some money tonight. That's that's mine. All righty. Sammy, what do you think? 
Oh, so much of me wants to go with them both, but um, as far, um, like I said, they've got a great idea there, and it just, I think, fell short of what it could have been. And um, and I hate to do this, because, yeah, as everybody said, any one of these songs could have taken Song of the Week if they weren't all on the same show. So um, I'm just going to be the one dissenting vote and and go with track number two because I, I think it's more uh, cohesive and complete. All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. And uh, even though it's not unanimous, song number three, Once Upon a Time by Viper Ship, is going to be our song of the week. And again, don't forget to cast your uh, votes. Tell us what you think. Go to our witness statement and complete that at musicsceneinvestigation.com slash witness. And uh, Rob, I appreciate you being on with us. I'm sorry we had some issues uh, tech-wise, but uh, darn good to have you back with us, man. Uh, Thank you so much for having me and for putting up with my persistent technical problems, um, which we never seem to get to the bottom of. And I know it's something between here and and the, the telephone exchange at the bottom of the road, but um, it's always great. And, I, you know, when, when I get that uh, that last minute message, by the way, Ian, your email that you sent yesterday arrived at quarter past four this afternoon. <laughs> so thank heavens for Twitter is all I can it, say. But, you I, know, when I, I have, when I get that message, I always say I, yes. I don't have to think twice about it. <laughs> You're a top man. I have real problems with iCloud yesterday. I couldn't even uh, email Rich to tell him how good his parrot drone video was. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we definitely appreciate it, and thank you for being here. Thanks to everybody out in the chat room and who may happen to have seen us live or if you're watching on the uh, recorded version. Thank you for joining us as well. We'll be here again next Sunday. Uh, doing it all over again. We'll have three new tracks. A note for you, however, before I leave today, or before we leave today, I guess, we're all in the same place. Uh, Before we leave today, (laughs) during the month of May, Tom, unfortunately, is not going to be joining us. Tom's got some things that he has to take care of business-wise. Splitter. uh, Pardon me? (laughs) Splitter. And we're going to have a uh, another in-house panelist join us, one of our guests, uh, Mr. Mark Lamdansky from uh, Worldwide Indie Radio, will be joining us in May. So uh, you'll be able to see how he does in the hot seat, as it were. All right, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it again. And uh, we're going to play out with Viper Ships once upon a time as we say so long to everybody. Again, Ian. thanks Ian. for being yeah. here. Yes, Tom. They are from Madrid, Spain. There you have it. Madrid, Spain. All right. This is Viper Ships Once Upon a Time. One more time as we sign out on Music Scene Investigation. Enjoy it. Bye. Bye.
Sim.